Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Firas Hamdan. I was raised in, born and raised in Massachusetts. Uh, my mother is a Southern Baptist Protestant Christian. Um, also born and raised in Massachusetts. My father is Lebanese um, from the South. He's Shia Muslim. Um, I grew up mostly around my mother. I grew up Christian, going to church on Sundays, um, celebrating Christmas, Easter, all of these things. Um, the area that I grew up in is mostly, you know, Anglo-Saxon, white American Christian. Um, it was not a very diverse area. You know, I think the nearest, the nearest mosque was about an hour and a half away. Um, you know, halal meat is also an hour and a half away. Anything pretty much like Islamic or ethnic or anything is very far. Um, so you can imagine like the area and, you know, what I had to like, uh, grow up around. But for the most part, uh, everything I've known my whole life until I was about 13, 14 years old was typical American. You know, I, you know, I went, I ate pork, I did all those things. Uh, you know, I didn't know it was wrong. Um, my father, he's, you know, Muslim, but wasn't, you know, as practicing as he uh, could have been. Um, so for the most part, my knowledge about Islam was pretty much, you know, all I knew was you don't drink and, you know, they believe that there's one God and uh, Muhammad is their prophet. Other than that, I had no more, uh, not much more knowledge about Islam. So, um, so you could say for the most part, I was raised as a typical white American, you know, not knowing much about like being Arab or being like Muslim. All my life, I did have this sense of like, you know, belonging to a higher power. You know, I, I always believed that there was a God. Um, you know, even while I was going to church and while I was, um, I guess you could say Christian. Um, I always had this like uncertainty of, you know, when I was practicing Christianity because of the, you know, Holy Trinity, um, Jesus, the Son of God, you know, all of these things. Um, you know, I was just like told to believe it. You know, my mom would always tell me about it and, you know, everybody I grew up around, it was a very common thing. Um, but all I know is that you know, from a young age, I always knew that, you know, there had to have been a God and that he'd have to have at least, you know, a universal message for everybody to, um, for everybody to live by. And I wasn't, obviously, you know, as a young kid, I wasn't exactly sure of what that was. Um, I had a lot of questions, um, you know, that arose during, uh, when I was young, going to church and stuff like that. But I didn't have anybody that would satisfy those answers. You know, my mother, she was a very devout Christian and she still is. But she's by no means a scholar, obviously. So um, I always, definitely always had this uh, belief in a God uh, my whole life. I first heard about Islam when I was uh, around, I would say, 11 or 12 years old. Um, this was during the time when, you know, 9-11 happened. Um, you know, the reason I heard about it, obviously, is because during school time, you know, everyone's talking about it, you know, all this, like, Muslims are terrorists and stuff like that. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, kids, they didn't know that I was um, Arab. They just thought, you know, I had a weird name. You know, they just thought, like, okay, he's got, like, dark hair, dark eyes. He could be, like, Italian or Mexican or something. They didn't know what I was. So, um, but they did know that my dad was foreign or something, and I guess somewhere... Along the lines, they found out that my father is Muslim. And they used to say a lot of things like, oh, you know, your father is like the reason for uh, for this, his people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I mean, I was 11, 12 years old at this time, and I didn't know how to defend my own father because I didn't know much about Islam. You know, the, I knew not even the bare essentials of Islam, very few things. So, uh, you know, I was... Uh, I was actually like afraid because like I was like, is this like what my dad, you know, like what my relatives are like, da da da. I was like, it can't be, it can't be true. So I used to, you know, I'd go to my dad, I'd ask him some questions. My dad, you know, he just gave me like very broad, basic questions. I kept asking him very specific things. And uh, again, he wasn't able to really answer a lot of uh, questions I had. So I had really no other choice than to go to the library, to go online, um, you know, I searched anything I could, you know, all these um, 
lecturers on YouTube. And um, that's basically when I started researching into Islam, you know. And um, once I watched one video, it got me hungrier for another one and another one and another one. And, you know, it came to a point where my father, he actually caught me at nighttime, you know, at like 2, 3 in the morning on a school night. And I was downstairs, and back then we only had one computer in our house, you know. And I was on that at like 3, 4 in the morning just watching lectures of, uh, you know, Ahmed Didat debating Christians, like, you know, about how uh, Jesus doesn't say in the Bible that I'm the Son of God and any of this stuff. So um, I would say from like 12 years old, that's when I started like researching. Um, you know, and it took me about, I'd say, two, three years of, you know, watching lectures and reading so many books to uh, to finally convert to Islam. And uh, at that point, you know, I was, it, it took it took a lot out of me. It was very hard for me to let go of that belief that Jesus is the Son of God because ever since I was a kid, that's all I've ever been taught. If you don't accept Him, you know, you're going to go to hell because of this. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't like a very quick thing. It wasn't like, you know, a son, like I heard one verse and I was like, that's it. Or I heard one thing and that was it. It took a lot of convincing because obviously I had my own bias. You know, I heard many things about what Islam says, this and that, and I had to satisfy it. Um, so that, it was around like 12 years old, I'd say that's when I started. The need to, to search and to figure out what exactly Islam was, I think it was more of like a, a way of trying to justify like, you know, my father is a good person. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people at that time were saying, you know, this, this and that about Islam, terrorists, they abuse women, you know, they're chauvinistic, all kinds of stuff like this. So, and I know my father is not like that, obviously. Um, so I just wanted to kind of like, you know, feel good about myself and know that that's not the case. But what I found was much more. I found truth in it. You know, I found things that, made much more sense than what I was already believing, you know, going to church and stuff like that. They brought up a lot of questions that I couldn't argue, and it basically just opened my mind, you know. I always wondered why, you know, we're supposed to be a monotheistic religion, Christianity, yet we have three gods. You know, you can pray to God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. I never really understood how that, you know, one God. Um, that's one of the things that really attracted to me, Islam. Islam, it's very simple one God, you know, one prophet, and uh, that's really what attracted me the most to it. Um, at that time, because, you know, I had no, you know, friends, no relatives, no Muslim contacts at all. Uh, when I went online, most of what I seen, uh, most of the websites I found, lecturers I found were Sunni websites or Sunni uh, speakers. So at that time, that's what I believed in, you know, and for the most part, I was more concerned with the oneness of God. Um, I wasn't really going into, you know, like uh, the history so much about Islam. I was mostly concerned with, you know, what do they say about God? What is God like? You know, does God look like a person? Does he have blonde hair and blue eyes? You know, can you see what God looks like? All of these things. Um, those, I think, were the points that I really looked for. The books I looked for were about that, the lectures I looked for were about this kind of thing. Um, so I would say for about, let's see, from 12, 13 years old until 18, that's that whole time I was a practicing Sunni Muslim. I looked up online how to pray like a Sunni, uh, all of these things I practiced exactly like a Sunni. So during uh, the period between I was 12 to 18 years old, this whole time I was uh, very serious. You know, I, uh, at that time, you know, I, I went to school, I played sports and stuff like that. I was the only Arab slash Muslim in my entire school, you know, from elementary school to middle school all the way to high school. Never, never had Muslim or Arabs as classmates. I was the only one. And, you know, in a way, I kind of liked it. I was very, uh, very serious and I wanted to be a good example for everybody else, you know, and I was not afraid of being different. I remember my junior year in high school, I decided I wear uh, like the skull cap. I think they call it a kufi. I wore it to school every single day. You know, um, 
I wanted people, you know, I wanted people to come up and ask me, why do you wear this? Why are you, you know, like this? You know, uh, why don't you eat pork and stuff like that? Of course, during that time, I was still eating, you know, haram meat, you know, and all that other stuff, but they don't know. Uh, they didn't know that what I was doing was wrong, but, um, but yeah, I always, like, I kind of wanted to attract this attention. And I think that's, uh, in the beginning, that's what I really liked about Sunni Islam, because they do, you know, they have a lot of da'wah, like, uh, videos and stuff like that. They go out to non-Muslims very much, and they're very active. And that's kind of how I was. You know, I was very, like, out there. I was, like, you know, debating people a lot in school, Christians, Jews, you know, I was very into that, you know, especially with Christians. I always, anytime... You know, there was people talking about politics or religion. I wanted to be the first one in there and say my two words, you know. But uh, when I was uh, 18 years old, a senior in high school, um, you know, my father, you know, he it's not like my father didn't see all this. He noticed, he's like, oh, my son, he's, he's a Salafi. Like, he's praying like this. You know, he's saying everything is like, bida, bida, you know, and... Um, uh, you know, my dad had a conversation with me. He's like, you know, why are you, why are you Sunni or whatever? You know, he started saying a lot of things. He's like, you know, they, they did this and they did that or whatever. And I was, I wouldn't take anything my dad would say seriously because, um, because, you know, at the beginning when I started researching Islam, I kind of established that my dad is not like a valid resource of, of what, you know, religion is. So, um, I was, I would argue with him about these things and I would, you know, beat him with the Sunni argument against my dad who's Shia, you know. So, you know, I said to myself, I was like, okay, you know, I was turned off already by, you know, Shiism. I seen a lot of things online, you know, pictures, stuff like that. Um, you know, I would be in a lot of chat rooms and stuff online saying that Shia, they hate the, you know, companions, they hate all of these things, you know, hate, 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 all these. So I was just wondering, like, what made them hate these people so much? Or do they hate these people so much? All of these questions kind of uh, arose. So I was like, you know, I owe it to my dad. Why don't I just, like, check into this, see what it's like? So um, I started trying to find Sunni Shia, you know, debates online. And mostly what I just kept finding was Sunnis talking about Shiism. I never really found a lot of lecturers of Shiism, uh, Shia lecturers talking about Shia Islam. So I kept getting a lot of these people saying, you know, that they, you know, during like Ashura, they turn off the lights and they commit adultery with each other. They, you know, believe that, you know, Ali is above the Prophet. They worship the Imams, like all of these things. So I was like, you know what, uh, when I was going to church, people would say a lot of things about Islam. So I was like, okay, this sounds a lot like what I was told about Muslims before I became Muslim. So let me look into it a little bit more. So uh, I started listening to some lectures. I found uh, a few. I found uh, Hajj Hassanin Rajabali. I found Said Amar Nakhshawani. Uh, I found a few others too. And, you know, they started talking about um, the history a little bit more. And I realized I didn't know too much about the history. I just know more about like the theology, just basically beliefs in God and stuff like that. So when I started looking into the history, Imam Hussein came up. That was the biggest thing for me when I became, uh, when I decided to lean more towards the Shia, uh, school of thought. I never heard about the, the martyrdom of Imam Hussein before that. You know, some of the hadiths and stuff like that that I heard when I was listening to Sunni lectures, most of it was when, uh, Hassan and Hussein were little kids. Very little things about them. Almost nothing. You know, um, I knew Imam Hussein was killed, but I didn't know it was a massacre or anything like that. I was not taught that. So, the first thing that I seen about Imam Hussein when I, when I heard about the massacre, that made me really doubt what, everything that I ever learned, you know, when all these books that I read, all the lectures I heard, you know, I used to listen to, uh, Khalid Yassin, I used to listen to Hamza Yusuf, uh, Ahmed Didat, um, Yusuf Estes, all these guys, all these uh, Sunni lecturers. Never once did I hear anything about Imam Hussein and Karbala and how he was sacrificed. So, once I heard about that, that, that made me dive into the world of Shiism. So when I first decided that, you know, Shiism is for me and that I accepted the uh, path of Ahlul Bayt was um, a little bit after learning about the tragedy of Karbada and then um, 
after that, I started looking more into Imam Ali and his life and what actually happened. Um, some of the answers that started to make sense. You know, I seen some battles like the Battle of Jamal. You know, I I'd see Ali radiallahu anhu fights against Aisha radiallahu anhu. And at first, I didn't, you know, I didn't say, I uh, think anything of it. But then I was thinking, how can, you know, thousands of Muslims die in this battle and there's not one right or wrong side? If I was there, you know, one question that I was asked before uh, by a Muslim when I was online researching a lot, he asked me, he said, if you're a Christian, right, you believe that Jesus, uh, you know, has to be sacrificed for you to be saved. He said, if you were there during the time of Jesus being sacrificed, would you try and save him? Or what side would you be on? Because if you save him, then he's not dying for your sins. So, you know, who do you, who do you accept as God? And it's kind of like a, you know, a situation that basically shows all the imperfections in it. Uh, in, in Sunni Islam, if you're, if you were there during the time in the Battle of Jamal with Ali on one side and Aisha on the other, you have to choose. You know, there's a right or a wrong side. And that made me think about many other things. There's a lot of other battles, you know, obviously Battle of Safin, you know, uh, the Prophet said, you know, Ahmad ibn Yasser, he'll die shaheed on the right side. You know, who killed, who killed Ahmad uh, ibn Yasser? Amr ibn Yasser was killed by Muawiyah. So a lot of these things, it just kept adding up, adding and uh, adding up, you know, and I didn't know any of these things. I know very, like, you know, I know about, you know, Abu Bakr, Omar Uthman, a lot of their good deeds, you know, while I was Sunni. But I never heard any of these other very controversial things, you know, and once I started seeing that, it was like an onion. It just kept peeling and peeling and peeling and kept smelling worse. And, uh, Shiism, you know, everything that I was told about it, they had an answer for. There was a lot of things that I was very uncomfortable about, you know, about Muta, about, you know, the 12 Imams and do you pray to them or what is it, Tawassal or, you know, et cetera, all these questions. Um, I, I got an answer for it and I got uh, not just a Quran uh, verse, but I also got Hadith to back it up, Tafsir and all of these things. And uh, a lot of the Shias that I listen to online, they were just extremely knowledgeable in history. You know, I never, I, it was like sitting in a history class. Um, most of the, the lecturers that I heard that were Sunni, they talked more about just kind of like, you know, rational thoughts, like, you know, okay, of course God is one. Like, they would talk about Christians, like, how can you believe, you know, that Jesus is the Son of God? Don't you have, you know, a mind? God is one. So when I was becoming Shia and I was thinking like all of these guys, they would talk so uh, confidently to these Christians and saying, you know, how can you believe in the Trinity and all these things? You know, you're an adult. Well, I was thinking if you guys are talking about how can they believe that? You have Imam Ali. He was born in the Kaaba. You know, he was, uh, what do you call it? The successor of the Prophet. All of these things that he has, you know, under his belt. And you put him as the same as other people. You know, all of these things that I was seeing in Christianity that I, like, thought that made me doubt, I was finding them a lot within Sunni Islam. And Shia Islam, I did not find any faults. Every question that I had, I was given a very satisfying answer. So, when I first, uh, I guess, reverted or converted again to, uh, to Shiism, that was, uh, I would say my real, real conversion. Because before, when I was Sunni, you know, I used to eat, you know, anything, chicken, there was, you know, haram food and stuff like that. When I became Shia, I was like, okay, that's it. Like, this is, I have, you know, looked at it from every angle possible. This is, you know, the true religion of God. So I took it very seriously. Uh, I remember one day I was at home, and for a while now, I've been eating haram meat while I was Shia, and I was like, okay, I can't. In my head, I kept saying, I can't do this. I can't go on for lo uh, much longer eating this and knowing that it's wrong. So one day, my mom, she made a meal for us. Uh, we sat down. And I looked at it, and I'm like, all right, that's it. This is my last meal. This is it. Like, I can't, I can't keep doing this anymore. So I told my mom, I said, listen, I'm going to eat this right now. But I'm telling you, from now on, I'm not eating any more meat unless it's halal meat, okay? And... 
my mom thought I was joking. And my mom actually didn't even understand, you know, the concept of like halal and not, you know, halal meat. So, uh, of course, you know, what's she going to do? She's my mother. She's been cooking food for me since I was a kid, you know, and I've been eating it. My mom's an amazing cook, obviously. So she was very angry. Um, I knew it was going to happen because I know my mom's thoughts about Islam. She's, um, you know, it's been very hard practicing, you know, uh, around my mom because I know it bothers her a lot. And she's, um, you know, she prays a lot for me. I, uh, she always thinks that I'm going to come back and stuff like that and always invites me to her Bible studies. But sometimes I go just, you know, just for, uh, for whatever. But, um, anyways, uh, I remember she told me, she said, if you're going to do that, if you're going to start eating, you know, blessed meat, uh, then I'm not going to cook anything for you anymore. So at that time, between 18 and 20 years old, uh, when I graduated from high school until 20, my mom, she didn't cook any more meals for me. I had to cook everything for myself at home. That was probably the hardest time of my life. My parents, at that time, they got divorced. Um, my father, he moved back to Lebanon. I was home uh, with my mother and my younger sister. I inherited a lot more responsibilities. And on top of that, I made my mom much more angrier uh, than she needed to be. So uh, at that time, it was very tough for me. And some of the friends that I made at uh, the Sunday mosque that I used to go to, um, I didn't tell them right away. You know, um, I kind of just like didn't really uh, didn't really say anything. You know, I would bring up certain like Shia beliefs. You know, subtly, I kind of was using uh, taqiyya in a way. You know, I would bring up like issues like, do you think the Prophet would ever make a mistake or you know, come on, you know, Imam Ali, like, I, I really think that he deserves a higher status than what he has, stuff like that. But eventually, you know, they figured it out, you know, I started praying differently, they started asking questions. Um, some of my friends, they were Maliki, so they prayed with their hands down, so they didn't really get right away that I was Shia, they just seen that I was starting to pray a little differently. But, uh, but then, you know, like, I, I really, I started saying some stuff during, uh, around Muharram when I would go to the mosque and they would fast, you know, on the 10th of Muharram. And I would find out exactly why they do that. You know, it's, um, uh, my friend, he told me, he's like, you know, the 10th of Muharram is a good day. We should fast. And I was like, what do you mean? Why do we need to fast? Um, his name was Fuad. Uh, I told him, I said, Fuad, you know, you know, this is the day that the grandson of the Prophet was martyred. You know, uh, this is a day we need to mourn. You know, we should think about exactly, you know, how, like, you know, his family dealt with it and all these things and stuff like that. And he said, that was the first time I remember they're like, are you Shia? And I was like, I, I know I couldn't hide it. And I was like, yeah, I'm Shia. You know, I, I can't, I can't do these things anymore. You know, I know what's right and what's wrong. I can't pretend like I don't see them. And after that, you know, I noticed they started uh, distancing themselves. So they stopped, you know, asking me to hang out as much. Uh, I remember one time after a while, after a few months, they asked me to come to their house. Uh, it was like a big group of friends. Um, they invited me down into their basement where we used to hang out. And, you know, they were very serious, very, very serious. They're usually always joking around, stuff like that. But they were all very serious. And at this time... They were all like, they grew their beards very long and they were wearing like, you know, dish dashes all the time. You know, I noticed like a big difference within like a few months, uh, period. They sat down, they told me, they're like, for us, listen, you're our friend and you know, you can't be Shia. Like, we care about you. We don't want you to go to hell. Like, you can't be Shia. They're like, what's, what's the deal? Why are you Shia? You know, just because your father is Shia, you don't have to be Shia. First thing I told him was, I'm not Shia because my father, father Shia. You know, I, you know, I'm, I was Sydney before. So obviously, I'm not Shia now just because my father told me to. If, it, if he told me to be Shia, I would have been Shia a long time ago if I wanted to say, uh, believe it from him. So they started asking questions. I would give them, you know, a lot of things that, you know, I was seeing, uh, ways of doing wudu and stuff like that. Hadiths of, you know, Abu Hanifa and uh, Imam Jafar Sadiq, alayhi salam. Um, but everything that they said, they're like, no, this is not, this is not true, and this is not true. Anytime I'd ask them, okay, can you give me, you know, an argument for this from the Quran, from a hadith, anything like that? 
they just say no like you guys you you have a made up uh like hadiths they're not uh strong you know even they would say you have a different quran you know i told them well, okay if we have a different quran okay give me you have a quran over there let's take your quran and let's let's see uh how it goes so obviously that didn't get anywhere um I didn't hang out with uh, uh, my Sunni friends as much. So I started trying to look for Shias within my area. By within my area, I mean like they lived at least an hour and a half away. Because where I live, there's nothing. There's no Shia, there's no Muslims, let alone anything, you know, ethnic at all. So I started looking like on uh, Facebook, anything for like Shia groups within Massachusetts, you know. Uh, I found uh, a couple that lived in a nearby city. You know, and I sent them a message. I said, hey, you know, is there any like Shia mosque around here? Is there any Shia like, uh, scholars, sheikhs, something like that? And, you know, alhamdulillah, he, um, he got me connected with some brothers and, you know, I was able to go to an actual, uh, majlis for, uh, Imam Hussein. I remember my first, uh, the first majlis I ever went to during Ashura it was the night of Abbas. And I didn't know at all what was being said. It was all in Arabic. Matter of fact, it wasn't even uh, a lecturer. It was, uh, we went to a, a small house. There must have been like 30 people at max. And we were just watching a TV of a guy speaking, you know, and I didn't understand anything he was saying. I'd ask, you know, one of the guys I was with, you know, what, who was he talking about? He said he was talking about, you know, Abu Fadl Abbas. And he was, you know, explaining to me more detail in, uh, in the story and I remember that day was like very strong for me I was like you know I remember from that day I was like that's it you know I'm gonna find an area where there's Shia and I have to have to be there because not not only I'm very isolated from Muslims in general but like being around Shia there's no nobody I know so uh, when I was 20 years old I transferred to a college that was uh, in Boston you know closer to the inner city and there was uh, a Shia center there that was a little bit bigger. I went there, and uh, that's when I learned a lot more. I would read much more books, Peshawar Nights, uh, Najl Balaga, of course. Um, you know, a lot of books by Imam Zain al Abidin. Um, but uh, that was, uh, the I th I'd say the biggest uh, point when I was Shia was the first night that I went to uh, a Majlis um, for Imam uh, for Abu Fadl Abbas. You know, the, the Ahlul Bayt, they, they saved me from a very, uh, like troubling existence in life. You know, when I was, uh, younger, when you come from like a mixed family, when your mother's, you know, American, Anglo-Saxon white, your father's, you know, Arab, he's Muslim, and my mother's Christian, you're very, you have an identity crisis. You know, I didn't know where I belonged. Um, I was struggling being, you know, a, a Christian. Uh, I didn't know, like, if, you know, Muslim is the right faith and stuff like that. But once, once I got satisfied with, you know, the path of Ahl al-Bayt, um, they saved me from a lot of things. You know, most of my family, they're not, uh, Muslim. You know, and I see their lifestyles are much different than mine. Uh, everybody I grew up around are not Muslim. Uh, they got into a lot of drugs, you know, alcohol, uh, partying, stuff like that. And I know I could have easily been influenced, uh, with that. If I didn't have these role models like Imam Ali alayhi salam, like Imam Hussein alayhi salam, like all of the, the Imams we have, the Prophet, of course, um, if I didn't have, you know, a solid foundation for Islam as far as like when I first started learning, I could have easily fallen into this, um, this lifestyle. You know, and I, uh, I was mostly in the world of sports. And in the world of sports, you know, you get offered a lot of things. And if I didn't have a strong faith, you know, in the Ahlul Bayt, then I would have easily fallen. Um, and so I, I definitely would have to thank uh, uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam because Karbala, when I learned of this, it was one of the strongest uh, impacts in my life. You know, as a Christian, they they really like sell the crucifixion of Christ, you know, to, to somebody. And it's very like strong when you hear it uh, in church from a Christian preacher. You know, it's a man is being crucified. So obviously there's a lot of um, emotions there. When I heard about Imam Hussein being sacrificed, it was kind of like, it was kind of like a good, uh, transition. 
um, from, you know, the crucifixion of Jesus to how uh, Imam Hussein was basically crucified. Um, that, that story with me was very strong. Anytime, you know, I was going through difficulties, whether it was at school um, or at home or, you know, anywhere else, uh, I would think about, you know, Imam Hussein and the sacrifice, about Abu Fadl, about, you know, Ali Asghar, all of, all of uh, the, the Ahlul Bayt who were sacrificed during uh, Karbala. Thank you.